Thank you for joining us for our online gathering at Hope Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. We exist to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower. We're honored that you're tuning in. We hope you enjoy the service. Church family, my name is Kat and I wanted to thank you for taking the time to watch our online worship service today. At Hope Church, we exist to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower. If this happens to be your first time joining us, we want to get to know you better. Go ahead and open up the Hope Church LV app or visit hopechurchlv.com and click connect with us and fill out the short digital connection card so we can do just that. As you know, this weekend we remember those who lost their lives during the tragedy of 9-11 20 years ago. We remember the first responders and volunteers who laid down their lives. We remember the individuals and families who are mourning and hurting. We remember those who are carrying the wounds and trauma of that historic and hurtful day in our nation. This weekend, please join us in praying for the individuals, families, and our nation, that God would bring healing and fill our lives with His peace and hope, not only for today, but every day. Psalm 147.3 says, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Before we jump into our service, if you're not already connected in community at Hope, it's not too late to join a connection group starting next Tuesday or Wednesday. Learn more on the Hope Church LV app or by visiting hopechurchlv.com. Lastly, are you following us on social media? If you have your phone close by, open up Instagram or Facebook and give us a follow by searching Hope Church LV. One of the ways we are celebrating Hope's 20th birthday this month is by posting stories on our account. When you see the stories, we would love for you to like, comment, and celebrate with us in this way. Well, that's all I've got, so let's continue with our gather time. Well, what's up, Hope Church? Today we're going to sing about our God whom we adore and sing the highest praise to. So whether you're in the room or online, let's sing this together.
Will you be my light when I cannot see? When I can't take another step, Lord, will you carry me? And when I've lost my fight, will you be my strength? Will you set me a table in the presence of my enemies? I shall not want. I shall not want. Oh, my soul's got a shepherd in the valley, and I shall not want. I shall not want. Oh, no, I shall not want. Because my cup's running over, running over. I shall not want. I will lift my eyes to where my help comes from. And I won't be afraid of the shadow because I've seen the sun. No, I will not stop when the way gets hard. Because the green only grows in the
But this is not the end. When you call my name, I'm gonna take my rest. There's a mansion in glory, and you're gonna meet me there. Come on, can somebody testify? I shall not. when we gather as a church family, our desire is to worship. One of the ways that we worship is by giving financially. God is our provider, and we're to honor Him with everything He provides for us. So right now, we're going to honor the Lord by giving as an act of worship. I wanna invite you today, if you've not already, to give through Hope Church to share in the mission locally and globally. Regardless if you're on campus or online for one of our services, there are multiple ways you can give, and you can see several of those ways on the screen. Church family, thank you for living generously. As we continue with our service, we have something very exciting to share with you. Early in the life of our church, God used a passage of scripture from Psalm 107 to shape the vision of this ministry. In Psalm 107, the Bible says, He turns a desert into pools of water and parched land into springs of water. And there He lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By His blessing, they multiply greatly. There are several significant promises within that passage, but one of them has to do with planting and multiplication. God used this passage from Psalm 107 to ignite our passion to see the church multiplied in our city, the West, and the world. And over the last 20 years, we have been a part of planting almost 80 churches in the Western United States with 22 of those new churches being right here in our city. In recent years, we have begun to seek the Lord about a strategy in addition to planting churches that allows us to see the church multiply. And we believe the time is now to officially launch a citywide strategy to start new Hope Church congregations across the Las Vegas Valley. Now, a common question is sure to be, what's the difference between a church plant and a Hope Church congregation? Well, in short, church plants are autonomous churches that we disciple, train, invest in, and send out with their own unique mission, vision, and values. Hope Church congregations will be contextual expressions of this ministry in different locations that have the same name, mission, vision, and values with local pastoral leadership and live in-person preaching. This is a very exciting step in the life of our church. And God has recently opened a door of opportunity for us to see the church multiplied based around this new strategy. I am thrilled to share with you that on September the 26th, 2021, 
a new congregation of Hope Church called Hope Church Henderson will hold its first official public worship service and we will become one church with two congregations. I want to introduce you to the lead pastor of Hope Church Henderson, Pastor Jeff Phillips and his wife, Sarah. We first heard about Hope Church in September of 2011. Vance and I met at the original Sunrise Cafe for breakfast one morning, and a friendship and a partnership began. I admired how Vance was leading Hope Church, and we instantly hit it off. Five years before we ever thought about moving here, we felt like our hearts were already aligned with Hope. Vancouver turned out to be one of the toughest seasons of our lives. It felt as if there were many more struggles than victories in our season there. We had been there for two years when we met up with Vance and Christy at the Southern Baptist Convention in 2012. We had lunch with them and Travis and Shar, and at that lunch, they absolutely breathed life into our hearts. They told us how much they believed in us and how they were for us. We cried so many tears at that table and felt so encouraged when we left. They had truly pastored us in that difficult time. As we look back over our season in Vancouver, we truly had a desire to plant and grow the way Hope Church has in Las Vegas. Basically, a Hope Church in Vancouver. But it just didn't go that way. And in 2016, I received a call from Hope that would change the trajectory of our ministry and introduce us to a whole new season as Hope invited us to move to Las Vegas and be on staff. We moved here in 2016 and Hope pastored us and gave us a place to simultaneously heal and create ministry in our next gen area. We are so grateful for all that God has done in our lives over these last five years as we have seen those ministries impact our church and families in our community. And recently, we had a new discussion with Vance and our Hope Church leaders, this one presenting a new opportunity and season for ministry once again, but right here in our city, as we have been asked and have accepted the lead pastor position for Hope's brand new congregation, Hope Church Henderson. We are so excited to have the opportunity to lead this congregation to places of healing and growth in the Henderson community. And it feels like we're coming full circle to our conversations years ago, still being encouraged by Vance and Travis and having a new opportunity in Henderson now to pastor and grow a community of believers the way Hope Church has in Las Vegas. We are so excited for the days to come and we celebrate 20 years of the ministry of Hope Church and how this church body has not only affected our lives, but thousands of others in Las Vegas, the West, and the world. In sharing this news with you today, I wanna to invite you to do a couple things. First, I wanna invite you to pray. Join us in asking God to move in a mighty way as we start this new congregation. Second, as you pray, we know that God is going to call some people to transition from this congregation in Las Vegas to be a part of starting this new congregation in Henderson. If this opportunity interests you at all and you would like to learn more, we would love for you to join us for one of our interest meetings on September the 12th or September the 19th. You can get all the details and register for one of these meetings on the Hope Church LV app or by visiting hopechurchlv.com slash Henderson. These are exciting days in the life of our church, and I hope you are encouraged to see how God is continuing to allow us to move the mission forward. Before we continue in a time of worship through music, I would like to lead us in a moment of prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so grateful for all that we have to celebrate this month. Lord, as we look back and as we look forward, we are so thankful for your activity in us and through us. Lord, I pray today during this gathering that we would worship. God, as we sing to you, as we look at your word, and Lord, all that's gonna take place in this service, Lord, we pray that you are honored and that you are glorified. Meet with us here, Lord. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. You are here 
part of the song because I understand we're just a bunch of humans in here a bunch of humans logging online today and there's some things and we can lift our hands and just during rehearsal I was kind of having a moment with the Lord earlier where I'm like believing that like God is a miracle worker and he's a promise keeper but hold on before you get too too stoked sometimes man I'm just not living in that like, there's some things in my life right now where I, I want to believe that he's working, but I just don't see it. And I want to I wanna see and I want to believe that he's doing miracles, but I just don't feel it. And I can't be the only one. And so I, I just thought I'd encourage you that this part, like, I get emotional every time I sing it, and I'll probably get emotional right now because God is at work because he's sovereign and good even in the midst of craziness in your life that's not sovereign and not good and seems out of control. We are here today, maybe you're in your living room, logging online, 
and God is at work, whether you see it or feel it in that moment. And so this is a moment for us, church, to lift up the mighty name of Jesus, to sing to a God who is able. He says in his word that if he called you and if you're a Jesus follower, he called you, he will do it. Not he might, not he's, he's thinking about it, he will do it. He is faithful. So if you need to press into a faithful God today, let's sing this with our whole hearts because we may not see it and we may not feel it, but he's at work. Let's sing this out together, church family. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when, yeah, come on. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see your work, yeah. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop. Come on, come on, let's worship in the most place. to God together. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for who you are and for what you've done and for the way that you still speak to us and move through us, the way that you continue to make miracles happen and that you always make a way when things are difficult or hard, that you choose to love us no matter what we do, that you have never left us or forsaken us, and that you desire to stay by our side through thick and thin. We pray that today, as we come together, that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us, convict us, and that you would move through us. We pray that you would give Pastor Vance the words to say from you, and that you would do a great work today in this congregation. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You know, we say all the time that before we are anything else, Hope Church is a family. The list is very short of people who have relocated their lives to plant a church in a different context and culture and seen God move in such a way that lives were changed, churches were planted, and nations were impacted.
As I watched that video, I actually watched it earlier this week in preparation for this weekend. And as I watched it then, and even as I stand here and watch it again this weekend, I am just overwhelmed with emotion. As I watch that video, I, I, I remember all of the stories behind the moments that they captured in that video, some of them incredibly joyful moments and some of them very difficult moments. But as I watch it, I have so many different emotions that run through me. And one, for, for, for example, I have the emotion of joy. When I, when I see those people being baptized and I see those worship experiences and I know so many of the families. As a matter of fact, I, I had lunch this week and uh, with, with a guy that was telling me his story of, of his life being changed here at Hope Church. And while we're sitting at the table having lunch, another guy walks in the restaurant and he comes over and starts telling me his story of his life being changed. And open. When I think about all the life change stories, as I look around the room and I see some of you and Know the story of, of what God has done in your life over these years as we've gathered together as a church. There's just so much joy when we think about the power of the gospel in changing lives. But in addition to joy, I, I feel the emotion of gratitude that God would allow my family to, to be a part of something like this for these 20 years because I promise you there were people more qualified to be a part of this than, than I was or we were as a family. As a matter of fact, when they first asked me back over 20 years ago to pray about coming out here and planting this church, the church that sent us out, their pastor was Johnny Hunt and Johnny Hunt had been counseled by those that were putting the plan together to send a team out to Las Vegas to plant a church. You need to find a guy who's over 35, who's from the West Coast, who's planted a church before. I was 28, never been west of the Mississippi River, and had never planted a church before in my life. So when I tell you I was unqualified, I was majorly unqualified. So to get to be a part of this for all these years, there's just such incredible gratitude that fills my heart and the heart of our family. But i got to be honest, also as I watch that video, there's the emotion of exhaustion. <laughs> it's been a lot of work. Uh, I watched that part of the video where the campus here was flooded and we're out there with shovels and squeegees and wheelbarrows cleaning things up. There's just been the, the, the initial video where you see that gym and all those chairs appear and disappear. It looked really quick on that video, but I'm telling you, it wasn't quick. Some of you moved a lot of those chairs and you know the exhaustion of 20 years of joining in God's activity doesn't mean that it's easy. We have to lay into that and to, 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 to labor with the Lord as we, we serve. But there's also the emotion of anticipation. As I watch that video, because here's what I know. God's not finished with Hope Church. The best is yet to come. The Bible tells us in Psalm 33 that the plans of the Lord are from generation to generation. Here's what that means. What God is doing in and through Hope Church is bigger than any of us. It's bigger than our city. It's bigger than our country. It's bigger than our lifetime. If we've really tapped into God's activity, that means it's going to continue on for generations to come. Long after all of us are like we sang in that song earlier, we're in the presence of the Lord in our mansion just cheering on from the sidelines. Lines, God's activity is going to continue in and through this fellowship. So there's a lot of emotion as I think about 20 years of looking back. And if you're a guest this weekend, that's really what we're doing this month. This month, we are celebrating the milestone of 20 years of God's activity in and through Hope Church. And so one of the things we're doing is we're looking back over these 20 years at the faithfulness of God through stories and videos and testimonies about what God has done. But we're also looking forward, looking forward to the opportunities that God is going to put in front of us to advance the mission. And as we're unpacking this this month together, our team landed on two words that we wanted to, to really focus on over this month together. And the first word, Pastor Scott preached uh, last week, and it was the word invite. And let me just say, by the way, I'm so thankful for the pastors that God's raised up at this church that over the last several weeks have just so faithfully preached and taught the word of God. What a blessing to be a part of a team like this. But he preached last weekend about all of our opportunity to join in God's activity by inviting other people to Jesus, inviting them to the gospel and inviting them to join in the mission of God. The second word is the word that I've been assigned this weekend to unpack for us. And it's the word invest, invest. 
And as I begin, I want to show you some numbers. And these numbers all have a story behind them. These numbers represent the way God has been at work in and through Hope Church over the last 20 years. So here's the first number. It's 26. You know what that number represents? 26 people that over these last 20 years, God has raised up out of our church. They've, many of them come to Christ here, been discipled here, and now they've sensed the call of God to be sent to the nations, and either for, for several months or for some of them years, for some of them the rest of their lives, 26 people who used to sit right in these seats are now serving in some country on the other side of the world, joining in God's activity. And not only 26, there are 13 more in the pipeline right now, 13 people in this fellowship who are preparing to relocate to the other side of the world to join in God's global mission. That's something that we get to celebrate. Here's a second number, 76. You say, what is that? 76 churches have been planted out of this fellowship in 25 cities up and down the West Coast. What a miracle of the Lord to be a part of a church. Totally, total honesty here. Before coming here to Las Vegas, I'd never been a part of a church that had planted a church much less to be a part of a fellowship that has now planted 76 churches out of our church. And listen, we have a plan to, 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 to reach the mark of 300 churches multiplied out of our church. Here's another number as we look back over these 20 years, 150. Say, what is that? 150 different go-time teams, short-term teams have been sent out of Hope Church representing a few thousand people to 22 different countries around the world. We've sent people out of our fellowship. Many of us have given resources so that they could go. We've, we've prayed for them and we've launched. We've brought them up on stage. We've prayed over them and then sent them out to 22 different countries around the world. Here's another number, 700 plus. 700 plus church planters have been trained right here through the leadership of Hope Church in planting churches locally and globally. Here's another number, 4,000. What is that? In 20 years, we've seen over 4,000 people trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior right here in Las Vegas, Nevada. And get this, over 3,000 of those people have been baptized into this fellowship. A lot of you sitting here tonight came to know Jesus right here through the ministry of Hope Church, and you've been baptized into this fellowship, and you're a part of all this that's taking place. Here's the last number when our team gave it to me that blew my mind. 10 million. What's that? Over these last 20 years, we've given away. Not talking about our ongoing regular budget. I'm talking about we've given away over $10 million investing in God's activity and expanding his kingdom to the ends of the earth. All of this, and listen, this is, I wish I could, this is just a snapshot. I mean, we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg of the activity of God. If we were to open it up and give a microphone, all of you could tell stories that would represent these numbers or other numbers in our fellowship of what God is doing in and through this local church. And here's a question I want to ask. How has God fueled his mission through Hope Church? How has God allowed for all this to take place. How has he fueled that? There's a lot of ways, to be honest, we could answer that, but I want to focus on one way. Your generosity. One of the values we have here at Hope Church is generous living. We live life ready to make a difference in the lives of others. And because you as a people are so generous through your generosity, God's mission through Hope Church is being and has been fueled. There's a saying that we use here often at our church. You've heard me say it thousands of times through the years, and here's the way it goes. We don't give to a church. We give what? We give through a church as an investment in God's kingdom being expanded locally and globally. We understand that the church is the vehicle through which we invest for God's kingdom to be expanded all over the world. And since the beginning of this movement called Christianity in the opening pages of the New Testament, God has always fueled his mission through the radical generosity of his people. 
And I want to take you to a place in the scripture that's a great example of that. If you have your Bible this weekend, open it to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, there is an incredible story about a small group of believers who were honestly the most unlikely group to be used this way. And God used them powerfully to fuel his mission. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm going to read the first five verses. Here's what it says in verse 1. We want you to know, brothers. Now, I know reading that in English, it didn't jump off the page. We want you to know, brothers. But in the Greek language, here's what Paul is really saying. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's saying, man, you have got to hear this. You have got to hear what God is doing at the churches in Macedonia. Paul is opening with this sentence to the church at Corinth. He says, you're not going to believe what is happening in Macedonia. So if you're with me, if you understand what Paul is saying, man, you're not going to believe this, say amen. Look at the person next to you, say, you're not going to believe this. Tell them, say, you got to hear this. All right, let's read it. Paul says, we want you to know, brothers. What he's really saying is what? You got to hear this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Paul says, man, there's something that's happened in these churches in Macedonia, and you're not going to believe what it is. What is it? He says, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty. Now, hold on right there. You ever played that game, what one thing doesn't look like the others? You know, you got the the three things on the sheet, and you're trying to figure out which one doesn't belong. What doesn't belong here? Extreme, severe affliction, extreme poverty, and abundance of joy. How do you get abundance of joy in the midst of severe affliction and extreme poverty? And yet Paul says, in the midst of this severe test of affliction... Their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty, what does he say? Have overflowed in the wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, Paul said, man, I saw it myself, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints, and this not as we expected. Paul said, man, we saw them. They're in this severe test of affliction. They're deeply poor. We did not expect this from them, and yet they demonstrated radical generosity. They gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Paul's writing this testimony about this church that demonstrated radical generosity. And honestly, it was the most unlikely of places. Paul said they were facing a severe test of affliction. The word affliction, it's a Greek word that means literally to squeeze to the, part, to the point of breaking apart. Their lives literally were in the midst of severe persecution. Much of that persecution because of them becoming followers of Jesus in the period that they were living in. They were being targeted for their faith. They were being persecuted. Many of them had lost their jobs. They'd lost family members. They'd experienced death. They'd experienced violence. All because they were followers of Jesus. And life was literally squeezing them to the point of breaking them. And Paul said if that's not enough, they also had deep poverty. This word poverty is a word in the Greek language that means to to beg. And it literally means somebody who's so poor that their only means of survival is begging from other people. And if that's not poor enough, Paul adds the word deep. He adds the word extreme. It's a word that speaks to the depth. It means that they were as poor as poor can be. Where I grew up, we'd say, man, these folks were dirt poor. They had nothing. And yet Paul says in the midst of that, There was an abundance of joy. Man, as I read that this week, I thought, good night. What if the church could be like that today? Listen, we're living in a day when everybody's going through a lot. There's a lot happening out there in the world. If you watch the news very much at all, you you begin to get discouraged and depressed. There's just all this. And listen, when the world looks at us, you know what they ought to see? In the midst of extreme difficulty, in the midst of tough circumstances, you know what they ought to see? They ought to see an abundance of joy. Because we don't have to live under the circumstances. That's this church in Macedonia. 
And I want us to look at four realities about their generosity, about their giving that I think we can learn from. Here's the first one. Here's what we notice as we look at them. Giving is a response to God's grace. Giving is a response to God's grace. Did you hear what Paul said here in verse 1? He said, the grace of God, and I put it back up before you, the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. He's not talking about what they did. He's talking about what God did through them. Paul was not drawing our attention to what the church had done. He was drawing our attention to what God had done through this church. The way this is constructed here that has been, it means something that happened to them. They had such an experience with the grace of God that they were responding to him in extreme generosity. They were so moved by what God had done in them that their response was generosity to the grace among them. Generosity, see, is the overflow of my gratitude toward God for his manifold grace in my life. Which tells us a couple of things about this idea of giving or generosity. First of all, giving is worship. Do you know that? Say that out loud. Giving is worship. Now, worship is... A lot of times we hear the word worship, and we immediately think about what we just did here on stage, right? We worshiped when we sang. We worshiped when we raised our hands. But the reality is worship is something so much bigger than just singing songs and experiencing worship together. Worship is my response of surrender to the grace of God in my life. Worship is not just how loud you sing when we sing. It's not how high your hands are raised. Worship is a response of surrender to the grace of God in and through our lives. The reality is the first time any of us worshipped, you know when the first time you worshipped was? The first time you really worshipped was at the moment of salvation. You know what happened when I got saved? When I got saved, I became overwhelmed with the grace of God. God and his grace had led me to the point of understanding that I had sinned against God. And because of my sin, I was separated from God. And there was nothing that I could do in my own strength to earn myself back into a right standing with God. But God had shown me and convinced me through his gospel that in Jesus, Jesus had done everything that needed to be done for me to be forgiven of my sin, for me to be restored back into fellowship with God, and for my eternity in heaven to be secured. And when I realized what the grace of God had accomplished in my life. You know what I did in response to that? I surrendered the control of my life to Jesus, and that was the first moment of worship in my life. Same is true for you. And as you and I as Christians experience the grace of God, the response to that is worship. And one expression of worship is generosity. Every time we give, every time we live generously, every time we invest in God's activity, it's an expression of worship. Warren Wiersbe said this about this church in Macedonia. Listen to what he said. He said their giving was voluntary and spontaneous. It was of grace, not pressure. They gave because they had experienced the grace of God. Grace not only frees us from our sins, but it frees us from ourselves. The grace of God will open your heart and your hand. That's why Paul said a little little further on in this text in verse 3, he said they gave of their own accord. It literally means that nobody pressured them, nobody coerced them. They made the choice voluntarily as an act of worship in response to his grace to give. We learn from them that giving, giving is an act of worship. But we also learn from them that giving is about the heart and not the pocket. I don't think anybody in the room didn't know when I was reading this text that Paul is talking about an offering that they gave. Paul opens this text by saying, hey, you got to hear what happened in Macedonia. You're not going to believe it. These, These people that had extreme persecution, they had deep poverty. He said they've overflowed in the wealth of their generosity. He said, you're not going to believe what God did through them. But you know what's interesting in this text of scripture? Paul never tells us how much they gave. Like, If I was telling this story, wanting you to get what happened and wanting you to be wowed by what happened in and through this church, I'd want to say, and guess how much they gave? Why didn't Paul tell us how much? Because here's the thing. The point of the passage is not how much they gave. The point of the passage is how they gave. Generosity is really a heart issue 
not a pocket issue. A clear principle of Scripture is that God is not impressed by the amount of our giving. He is pleased by the attitude of our giving. You know the reality is this weekend? There's not anybody in the room that can write a check that will impress God. He might impress some of us. But there's nobody in the room that's going to impress God. You know why? Because he doesn't need our money. Let me prove it to you. Look at Psalm 50. Psalm 50, God says, for every beast of the forest, it's mine. The cattle on a thousand hills, I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field, guess what? It's mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. For the world and its fullness. It's describing the world as a box. This phrase, the fullness, means everything in it. Here's what God says. It's already mine. God doesn't need a... Listen, God is not sitting in heaven every weekend going, man, I hope they give this weekend. (laughs) He's not wringing his hands. God's never worried about finances. He owns it all. I don't know what some of you are thinking. Well, (laughs) If God don't need (laughs) my money, then why am I giving? You see, giving reflects the attitude of our heart towards God's grace in our lives. If you don't believe me, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6? He said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Here's what that means. You want to know where your heart is? Look where you put your money. If you really want to know somebody's heart, just go through their budget. Look how we allocate our resources. Jesus said that'll tell you who you love. That'll show you where your heart is. It's one of the reasons that some people get so upset when preachers talk about giving or generosity or money. See, people don't get upset because we're talking about money. We get, they get upset because we're talking about their heart. That, that's what moves us. That's what angers us at times. Because the Holy Spirit of God begins to press in on us about our response to generosity. Paul wrote it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, another chapter after this one. This is what he said. For God loves a, say it out loud. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say God loves giving. It says he loves a cheerful Giver, it's all about the heart. Generosity is a heart issue. There are a lot of stories in the Bible that communicate this. My favorite one in the Bible, I've told it here at Hope several times in the past, years ago, but it's in Mark chapter 12. If you've got your Bible, flip over to Mark chapter 12. This is my favorite story in the Bible that communicates that this idea of generosity and this, this idea of giving is really a heart issue, and it's a response to the grace of God in our lives. Now, I've got to set the context for you uh, for this passage of Scripture. Look how it opens. It says, and he sat down opposite the treasury. Now, in, in, the, in, the, in the New Testament era, they were meeting in the synagogue, and when it came time for the offering... What, what they had was this box called the treasury. Now, at Hope Church, when we receive an offering, uh, we don't pass a plate. There are some places you can drop it off out in the, the courtyard or in the, in the foyer, uh, the lobby. But, but most people now give online. That's how the church in America, a lot of the giving now is all online. But in the New Testament era, they had one box sitting right down at the front. And at a moment in the service, everybody would file by the box and drop their offering in the box. How about that? Want to do that next week? We're just going to put us a box right here. You think that's not intimidating enough? Listen to the rest of it. And he, Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury. It means the box, Jesus sat down by the box. It's time for the offering. And Jesus sits down by the box. Look what it says. And watch the people putting money into the offering box. If you don't think God has a sense of humor, this is one of the funniest patches. So here, get this. Line of people getting ready to give their offering. Jesus comes, sits down by the box, and the Bible says he's watching them. It's the Greek word theomai. We get the word theater from it, meaning he's not just casually glancing. He's he's observing them. So get this picture. (laughs) 
Look what happens next. <laughs> Many rich people put in large sums. <laughs> I guess so, with Jesus sitting at the box, right? Can you imagine the conversation in line? Honey, is that Jesus at the box? Honey, give me your purse. What you got in there? Give me the car keys. Give me your rings. They get up here to the box. And they're like, oh, Jesus, we came prepared to give a big one today. And they drop it in the box expecting some kind of reaction. And Jesus just sits there. One by one, they file by. I mean, biggest offering this church ever got. Man, Jesus sitting at the box, people bringing money there. They're throwing in car keys, wallets, chains, everything they got. <laughs> Look what happens next. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. All these people come by, put in these big sums of money. And here's this little widow lady, reaches into her bag, pulls out two little coins that combined are a penny. And I'm sure she somewhat almost embarrassed, drops it in after seeing all these rich people give all these big sums. And look what happened next. And he called his disciples to him. You didn't get it. All these rich people come by putting in their big money. Here comes this little lady, drops in her two coins. Jesus says, Peter! James! John! Come here! You got to see this. And I imagine all the rich people going, uh, what are you talking about? She just put in two little coins. Listen to what he said. Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed, don't miss this, out of their abundance. Here's what that means. They gave him what was left over. They gave out of their surplus. They took care of themselves and whatever they had left over extra. They tipped God with that. But Jesus said, not her. She gave out of her poverty. She put in everything she had. All she had to live on. And that kind of generosity moved the heart of Jesus. Because giving is a response to his grace. You see, that woman had been so overwhelmed by the grace of God in her life, she just lavishly gave back to Jesus. Makes me wonder sometimes with the way I live and give has there been a moment in heaven where Jesus said, hey, y'all, y'all come here. You got, you got to see what's happening down here at Hope Church today. You got to see this. Second thing we learn from them about giving is that it's an act of faith. It's not only a response to his grace, it's an act of faith. Look at verse 3. It says, for they gave according to their means. As I can testify, Paul said, I saw it. And here's the part that really is this idea of faith and beyond their means. Personal testimony, nothing in my life as a Christian has grown my faith like understanding this principle of giving. When my wife and I first got married, my dad came over to our apartment and my wife and I, we had just got, we'd only known each other for 10 months. I was 20, she was 19. We got married. I know what you're thinking, man, what were you guys thinking? That's just it. We weren't thinking, right? Uh, We had no idea what we were headed into and we were living in some deep poverty Uh, We were so poor as a young couple. My last year and a half of college, I couldn't even buy textbooks. I just had to go to class, take good notes, couldn't afford textbooks. Um, And my dad came over and just really kind of apologized to me as his son and said, I've never really taught you principles of financial stewardship and generosity. And he got my wife and I sat around our kitchen table and just began to unpack some of the stuff that I'm sharing with you this weekend and taught us this principle of generosity and that this, this idea that you can live better on 90% than you can on 100% in God's economy if you'll just step out in faith. And for us, man, we didn't really understand it, but we believed it. We, we trusted it. And now for 30 years of marriage have lived this principle out. And, and I'm not sharing with you this weekend what I'm sharing with you as a paid salesman. I'm sharing with you as a 
self-satisfied customer, somebody who personally has lived out the principles that, 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 that we're learning from this church in Macedonia, and they are deeply transformational, but they will grow your faith. Paul tells us here that, that they gave, first of all, according to their means. It means they gave out of that which they were able. They gave according to their ability. The way I like to describe this is with this general principle of always a portion. I'll put it up here on the screen. Always a portion means in obedience to him, in obedience to God, God's people have always regularly given a portion of what God has given them. That's, that's one of the things we see in this church. They gave according to their means. Out of what God had given to them, they gave a portion back to him. That's the expectation for all of us as followers of Jesus. We get the invitation by God to join in his activity, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, through this vehicle of generosity by giving according to our means a portion of what God has given to us. And as soon as I say that idea of portion, some people that are Christians immediately throw the law card and they say, oh, you're talking about the Old Testament law that requires a tithe. And when they say that, to be totally honest, they hadn't really read the Bible. Because this principle of giving a portion goes way back further than the law. As a matter of fact, 500 years before Moses gave the law, Abraham gave a portion of what God had given him back to the Lord. And then Abraham's sons, Isaac and Jacob, generations before Moses gave the law, lived out this idea of giving a portion. Then within the law, Moses included this idea of giving a portion of what God had given to us back to him. He put it in the law starting at 10%, but if you study the full Old Testament law, the Jew in the Old Testament law was required to give 23.5% of everything that God gave them as an investment back into God's activity. Then after the law in the New Testament, in grace, we see the early church, the New Testament church. We're reading about one here in the book of 2 Corinthians that was living out this principle of giving according to their means. I'll give you a life-changing principle Giving a portion is not a requirement of the law. It's a privilege of the relationship. You see, God, by his grace, allows us to join in his activity through the vehicle of generosity. And that's what this church in Macedonia understood. And they were living out this principle by faith, even though they were living in difficult circumstances of giving a portion of what God had given to them. You say, where do I start with this idea of giving a portion? Listen, that's between you and the Lord. You have to develop your own conviction. My personal conviction, my personal conviction is the starting place for me and my family was 10%. 10% of what God had given to us through our income, we were to give back to the Lord. That was a starting place. Listen, but you have to develop your own personal conviction. What I'm telling you is the biblical principle that cannot be denied is that God's people have always given a portion of what God has given to them. But then there's a second phrase in this. The second phrase is that they gave beyond their means. Let that sink in for a minute. We understand this idea of giving according to our means, giving a portion of what God's given to us. But the Bible here says they gave beyond that. It's this idea of sacrifice. If you look at Scripture, you can really summarize the Bible's teaching on generosity with two phrases. The first one we looked at, always a portion. Here's the second one. Sometimes a sacrifice. Always we're to give a portion of what God's given to us. Sometimes we're to give sacrificially. In dependence on him, God's people have sometimes sacrificed to give beyond their ability. That, that phrase beyond in, in the text when it says beyond their means, it literally means the, out, the, 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 the idea of being outside of that which is even possible. They gave beyond what they could afford to give. I'm going to talk about this a little more next weekend, this idea of sacrificial generosity. But one of the reasons we're bringing this up in our 20th birthday month celebration is because on our birthday weekend, the last weekend of this month, we're setting aside that weekend to fuel future ministry opportunities that we believe God's opened up to us. At the end of the service, we're going to give you some more information but we're going to be asking our church the last weekend of this month to give a one weekend above and beyond sacrificial offering. We're telling you now so you can pray for the next two weeks about what you feel like the Lord may lead you to give. And that's all we're asking you to do. Pray and hear from the Lord and simply do that. Don't do it because we're having an offering. Do it because you hear from the Lord. 
But we're asking you to pray and hear from the Lord. And as you get the information, when you leave at the end of the service, you'll see that there are multiple levels. All the stuff that you see that we're going to give you, we're going to do. It's a matter of when we'll do it based on the generosity that we together as a people fuel God's mission with. But the last weekend of the month, that weekend, we're setting aside everything that comes in towards this sacrificial offering. Every dime that's given that weekend, unless it's designated somewhere else, everything that comes in is going towards this sacrificial offering, towards future ministry, investment, and involvement in and through Hope Church. But it requires faith. Giving is an act of faith. It means that even though it doesn't make sense, when my dad taught my wife and I, hey, you can live better on 90% than you can on 100%, guess what? In math, that doesn't make sense. But let me tell you what I've learned in 30 years. In God's economy, it does. You can live better on 90% than you can on 100. How do you get there? By faith. You trust God. And here's what I've learned. You can't outgive him. You can't outgive him. Let me give you a third thing we learned from him. Giving is a way to share in God's activity. One of the ways we get in on what God's doing is through generosity. Listen to what the text says in verse 4. Begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. You know, that's something, honestly, I've never seen happen in a church. These people literally beg them to take up the offering. Paul, we're begging you. The implication of the text is Paul looked at their situation and he saw the difficulty they were living in, the poverty they experienced, and Paul said, I'm not even going to tell them about the offering. We're not even going to bring it up. What they're living in it is as bad as what they're facing in Jerusalem where we're taking the money up to go help them. They got a situation just as bad. Paul said, we're not going to even tell them. And they begged Paul, said, Paul, we're begging you earnestly. It means they're pleading. They're literally on their knees saying, Paul, please let us take part. That phrase take part means to share and it means to join in the opportunity, to join in God's activity. They knew that God didn't need their money, but they knew that giving was an invitation to share in what God was doing. And they wanted to be a part of it. It's one of the reasons I love giving here at Hope Church. My family lives generously here through Hope Church. I I could never teach and preach this stuff if I wasn't living this stuff. My family believes in this principle. And for now 20 years, we've given generously. And one of the reasons we love doing that is because by giving here at Hope Church, we're sharing in the activity of God. I shared some numbers with you at the beginning of the sermon. Listen, if you've been generous here at Hope Church, every one of those numbers, you've got a part in that because of your generosity. Let me give you another snapshot. And this is just over the past 30 days. I just learned this stuff this week. I asked our team to give me some of this information because I wanted to hear it and I wanted to share it with you. And I've been away, so I didn't know any of this. And when I read it, I was just so encouraged. This is what's happened in just the last 30 days. And again, it's just some, just some sampling. In the last 30 days, over 300 first-time guests have attended our weekend services, heard the gospel. 31 of those people have been baptized, and another 41 have indicated a first-time decision to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. Just in the last 30 days. And listen, if you give here, guess what? You're a part of that. Did you know that one of our church plants in the last 30 days walked church, pastor by Hayden Ratner? One of our church plants has just launched a team out of their church to plant a new church called Favor City Church that on October 3rd is going to launch its first service at Green Valley High School. Here's what that means. We're grandparents. <laughs> our babies are having babies. The churches, that, when I said 76, that doesn't count all the churches that the churches we've planted and now planted. And some of them have planted 10, 15 churches out of their own church. We've been a part of it. How does that happen? Here's how it happens. Because you give. Let me tell you another thing. This is just the last 30 days. During the last 30 days, we've distributed 150 care bags through our monthly motel outreach and in so doing have identified two possible victims of sex trafficking and we're actively seeking right now to rescue them out of that, to teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ and to show them that Jesus values who they are. How does that happen? Here's how it happens. Because you're living generously. You're sharing in the activity of God. Do you know in the last 30 days, we've sent food and medicine to displace people in Afghanistan that's being distributed through believers on the ground to people who are hurting in the midst of what's happening in that global situation? 
Did you know that in the last 30 days we've given money to an influential church in Uzbekistan who had to close its doors but has now reopened post-COVID? It's the most influential church in that nation. Their pastor is currently in prison for preaching the gospel. And the church is thriving because of your generosity as a fellowship. And listen to me. All that stuff, just the last 30 days. 365 days a year. God is alive and at work through our fellowship. And listen, there's a whole lot of this stuff I don't even know is happening. There's a lot of this stuff you didn't even know is happening. But you're going to get to heaven? Some brother, sister from Uzbekistan is going to come say, man, thank you. You say, what did I do? You gave. And because you gave, you shared in God's activity in another part of the world. Let me wrap this up. I'll share one last truth. Giving is a reflection of Jesus. That's what we learn from these folks. We didn't read it, but if you skip on down in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, you get to verse 9. Look what it says. I'll put it up here on the screen. Paul says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. You know what that teaches us? The whole story of the gospel is a story of generosity. The heartbeat of the gospel is the story of a generous God who saw us in a condition that we couldn't fix ourselves and he gave his only son Jesus. Jesus stepped off the throne of eternity, stepped into time, took on human flesh, became a man, lived a sinless life, offered his body, gave everything he had, died on a cross for our sin, but he didn't stay dead, rose again from the dead so that you and I could be forgiven and by the grace of God be given a relationship with him. Here's what that means. You and I, my mentor Johnny Hunt says that you're never more like Jesus than when you're giving. Let's bow our heads together. Maybe you're here today and it's your first time ever in a church service. Maybe you're here and you've been to church before, but somebody invited you to come. and You're just hearing this talk about this church and the Bible and their radical generosity. Here's what I want you to hear. The whole message of the Bible is about this generous God who loves you. He loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus to die on a cross for your sin. He's inviting you into relationship with himself, but, it, but you got to respond. Like I talked about earlier, there's a response of surrender where you realize that Jesus loves you and that he gave his life for you and you surrender the control of your life to him. In just a moment, we're going to sing a song of response together. We're going to have pastors all along the front here. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to come to one of these pastors today and say, hey, I need Jesus. You want to give your life to them. You give your life to Jesus. You can do that by coming and just talking to one of them and they'll have somebody sit down with you and explain the story of the gospel, the power of how you can experience forgiveness and know Jesus and know what it means to go to heaven when you die. We stand and sing in just a moment. Just come to one of these pastors. Or maybe you're here and like we sang earlier, you're, you're going through a difficult season like Pastor Scott talked about, like EJ sang about. And Man, you just need somebody to pray with you about something in your job, your health, your family, a relationship. These pastors are going to be here and they'd be honored to pray with you and for you. Finally, we're going to just open this altar up. Maybe you just want to come be alone with the Lord and just ask God to move on your heart. Maybe in hearing this tonight, God's convicted you. God's spoken some stuff into your life, and you just need to come and just be alone with God. For This altar is going to be open. You can do that. Lord, in this moment, would you have your way? God, would you speak as only you can? Lord, would you move among us? God, I pray for those that are here that don't know you, Lord. I pray as soon as we stand, they'd come to one of these pastors and say, I need Jesus. 
God, I pray for those that need to be prayed for, that need to spend time with you. God, that they would move in this time. Lord, have your way in this moment. What an incredible sermon by Pastor Vance. We're going to close our service with one final song, but before we do, we believe that when we open up God's word, he desires to speak to us. If God is moving in your life, we'd love to connect with you. You can visit hopechurchlv.com slash respond. If today you did make a decision to follow Jesus, welcome to the family of God. We cannot wait to celebrate with you. In our gatherings, we always invite people to come forward and pray and to be prayed for. If today you need prayer, visit hopechurchlv.com slash pray for me. As you respond today, our team is going to lead us in one final song. So let's join them right now. Caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet Caught up in this holy moment Never want to leave I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry. When I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry. When I forgot that you're enough and take me back to where we started, I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up in your prayer.
We just maintain this posture of prayer and worship before the Lord. The altar's still open. Our pastors are here. But for those of you that are part of this fellowship, when you leave tonight, at all the doors, when you go out, you're going to get something that looks like this. On the inside, it unpacks what really we're doing this month. It's going to show you a lot of the future ministry opportunities that we believe God's led us to as a church and what that sacrificial offering on the last weekend of this month is going to go towards. And you'll be able to see as you look here how we've laid it out. It'll make a lot of sense. And if you have questions, you can shoot us an email. But everything that's in this brochure that you're going to get when you leave, we believe God's led us to as a church. We believe it's where we're headed, some of the things we're going to be accomplishing that God desires to do through us. But the reality is the speed with which we're able to do some of this is going to depend on how we respond in fueling God's mission. I believe wholeheartedly God's going to supply everything that we need in the days, weeks, months, and years to come. But we're asking you to pray, to take this, and over the next two weeks, just pray. Let God speak to your heart, and then come prepared on our 20th birthday. Birthday parties, usually about we, we bring presents. We're going to bring all bring a gift to the Lord on that day. That we're going to sacrificially give to Him as an investment, as what He desires to do in and through us. Scott, as we just bring this to a close, I want you to just sing that last little bit over us one more time, then you can close our service. The altar's open. Our pastors are here. Many are still here praying. You can come. You can be prayed over, be prayed with, pray alone with the Lord. But just begin to ask the Lord, God, speak to me, and I want to challenge you to grab one of these and then pray over for the next couple of weeks. Scott, sing that and then just close. Can do.